Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Spoiler in Time. Cord Killers is the show where we tell you the gear, the services, and the coming content that you can watch over the internet. Spoiler in Time is where we spoil that said content. And on today's show, we are going to spoil episode four of season two of Justified, episode three, season six, Game of Thrones, and Captain America Civil War. I'm Tom Merritt. He's Brian Brushwood. Are Dang you ready straight. to spoil? Yeah, no, I'm totally ready to spoil. Uh, where do you want to begin? Should we begin with this summer's movie draft? I'm really excited to get there. I don't know why. I'm sorry, Tom. We failed. We failed. It's not going to happen. What are you talking about? Captain America Civil War, 179 million in opening week. Not enough. Not enough. How is that not enough? I, uh, well, first of all. Explain to me the logic where 179 million opening is not enough for you. To win, we got to get over 800 million and uh and from captain looks, america well no 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 no, 800 million oh. total but it's right, like uh, okay. uh we do so, have the secret life of pets ahead of us but ghostbusters is looking crappier and crappier per the marketing so i'm less and less optimistic about that i was really hoping there was buzz about it having a 200 million dollar domestic opening weekend and uh i mean uh, don't get me wrong 181 million it's great it's great don't know that it's going to propel us to the winning position yeah, and by the way, if we keep seeing different numbers, it's because the spreadsheet is updating differently than some of the public numbers you see. You'll, you'll, it's 179 here. It might be 181. Yeah, mine says 179, too. Yeah. Uh, maybe but, maybe but, Bryce you know, is in the future. For the, rough, for the rough draft of this, it sounds like it's not that you're disappointed with Captain America Civil War. It's that you are fearing Ghostbusters. Uh, yes, I am fearing a big, big flop in Ghostbusters, uh, and that's the Alpha and Omega. That's exactly right. Uh, but meanwhile, next week, you've got Free State of Jones coming out. How excited are you for your $5 pick? Well, if it wasn't up against Money Monster, which is we have concerns, I'd feel exactly the same way. Dude, Money Monster is, uh, like, like they are doing a marketing bonanza for this. I think that might yeah. have been a steal at $11. I, I think Free State of Jones is, is going to do exactly the same as it would have had anything else been out in the theaters, though. Sure. Like that's that that was my point there. You're right. They are advertising the crap out of Money Monster, and it's it's certainly timely. I don't think it's gonna do crazy numbers. Here's where I am with Team DTNS, though. Uh we're at 343 million. We're only seven million behind Chainsaw Suit now. And Batman is, you know, hitting its its asymptote. It's it's not gonna make that much more. I oh, look at this sure. and I say, wow. Huntsman Winners War at 40 million. Really needed that to do 80. Ugh, Keanu at 15. Was kind of hoping that would do like 19 or maybe 40, you know, somewhere between there. It might, I guess, but it's probably not going to get much farther. But then I look at the Jungle Book 287, and I'll be honest, I, I looked back at my estimates before the show, Brian. Jungle Book Huntsman and Keanu all together, I estimated would make 288 million. Well, that's one of the best parts of the game, right? Is that you never know uh, which one's going to be your, your rock star, but but it's good that you have one. Uh, you still have, even after Free State of Jones, you have Now You See Me 2, Star Trek Beyond, and Suicide Squad. That looks to me like an $800 million combination. Yeah, uh, it's it's starting to look good there. Uh, Chainsaw Suit, of course, has Alice Through the Looking Glass, which I'm, it's I'm gonna starting do to garbage. feel like. No, it's going to Yeah, do it's garbage. not going to do well. Uh, and then they have Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which, which will, will also do, do garbage. Garbage. No, garbage, it'll, it'll garbage. do well. Or, nope. Why do you think it's going to do garbage? Uh, uh, mainly because um, it, it is a. Uh, oftentimes, uh, when there's a new franchise, the second movie can blow away the first movie. When it is a reboot of a franchise, oftentimes the second movie doesn't do as well. Uh, same thing. We, we saw right. this with Transformers. We saw this with a number of other movies. So that's. I, I don't think it's going to do that good. Well, then uh, let's get right into the actual events of the Civil War. Captain America's Civil War. We're not going to talk about Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, or will we? No, we won't. <laughs> I saw it at the Dine-In Theater Friday night, so I was slurping quesadillas while I watched it. How did you see it? I saw it this morning with my dad at the Alamo Draft House. Now, normally anything I see at the Alamo Draft House gets a, a, a automatic upgrade for you know having beer and pizza and so on. Yeah. So but, we both saw it with beer and food available. That's yeah, cool. but I saw it with my dad, who had not seen a single Marvel movie 
uh, up until this point. And it's like, I explained to him who Captain America was. He's like, oh, no, yeah, I remember that character. And Iron Man, he's like, well, who's Iron Man? And I kind of explained. Um, and it was really distracting to watch the entire movie knowing, like, like, even though I knew who everyone was, I couldn't help but think about, like, what does dad think of this scene? Does dad know whatever? Like, like, the opening scene with Tony Stark on stage doing a TED talk where he's talking about, you know, doing a reenactment of his feelings or whatever with a holographic pro- projection or whatever. Like, I, dad never realized that was Iron Man. He is just like, oh, that's some guy who's got money, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I don't blame him for it. And by the way, that scene, for the record, was amazing. However, they did young Tony Stark. Like, I don't know. It's the same thing they did in Ant-Man where they made uh, Michael Douglas look younger, right? I, I assume so. I assume so. It was it was freaking brilliant. I I bought it. Like like I'm uh, I'm certain that Robert Downey Jr. actually acted out that that bit, and then they just you know youngified him or something. Yeah, that's what that's what they do. And I I can't imagine Robert Downey Jr. isn't looking that saying, you know, we we could do a whole movie this way. I think. <laughs> well, and and that's that's the world we're headed towards, right? Yeah. Why not? Why not do entire movies where where people are are timeless and ageless? We and were especially- having a conversation on Current Geek, not to get too far off track, uh, where Scott Johnson was saying they should just do that with Harrison Ford for the Han Solo movie, and I was like, yeah, but then he's gonna move weird, and his voice is still strange. But I don't know, right? Maybe- and Neshcom yeah. nailed it in the chat. That's what they did for Pee Wee's uh, latest movie. They 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 made him timeless and young or whatever. Although it is uh, much like with the Pee Wee movie, he's slower, you know, and and it doesn't quite fit but uh okay so let's let's talk through this movie you got thoughts i got i have some thoughts my my overall thoughts were i was enjoying it I, you know always this kind of movie you start off with a chase scene you start off with a battle and we did and it was fun and it was good and i got the premise and i'm like yeah i've heard this a million times we need to be we need to control the superpowers it's and, and it is based on the comic book which was in some uh quarters considered a hackneyed analogy to september 11th and the reaction to that uh but i feel like they played that down and tried to make it more just within the universe i felt it started to slow down uh at one point when uh when we we, right before we see robert downey go visit spider-man yeah at the beginning of the second act it was really really slow and and but then we get the Amazing Spider-Man, and I mean that in the sense of both Amazing Spider-Man and I thought they did an amazing job with Spider-Man. I really enjoyed this entirely different take, making Peter Parker really be a high school student. Uh, And everything just started to snowball for me from there on out. I was having fun. Dude. I mean, three cheers for hot ass Aunt May. <laughs> Marissa Tomei as, as Aunt May is, is my favorite well, thing to happen. I'm calling that out because I'm sitting there thinking like, oh, I guess they, you know, wanted to cast young for 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 the for the aunt, and uh, and of course Robert Daddy Jr. is like, wow, okay, yeah, let's. let's and by, by the way, they didn't even cast young. She's in her fifties, right? Like, well, like like it's age appropriate. I mean, but isn't isn't Aunt, isn't Aunt May usually in her like? 60s or 70s i i Maybe not. I, I don't man, know man yeah i don't know don't don't well, don't ruin this Marissa fantasy Tomei and good for the Avengers. <laughs> yes uh dude that entire peter parker robert downey jr scene was absolutely electric it was so refreshing did you notice that they did not once talk about how we got his powers right <laughs> like they, nope. they got this close right and, and you started to talk about it and uh, iron man's like tony stark's like forget it I don't know. yeah 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 that that was my favorite tweet uh review about uh civil war was uh it was a good movie i'm just not clear how spider-man got his powers <laughs> <laughs> well and that's the interesting thing about having to and i know that feeling of watching it with someone else and you can't help but see it through their eyes it's like you're sitting there like, wow, I wonder if he if he wonders how Spider-Man because the rest of us are like, good. Thank you. Yes, we all know. I liked the balance of there being and and I'm going to review this movie or I'm going to think of this movie in terms of as somebody who's seen all of the others. And I think that's an important way to come to it. I think yeah. if you haven't seen anything else, there's a lot about the movie that doesn't make sense. It moves awfully slow. The set pieces aren't extraordinary. Um, there are a couple of moments that are great, whether you know anything or not. For example, when they're doing the fight, um, you know, seeing Bucky grab the oncoming motorcycle, grab the the handle, whip it around and just start going. It's like there, there, there was some great choreography. There's some great uh, stuff. But absent the context of the last however many movies of, of uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it's really hard to love this movie in the context of seeing all that. 
there is so much to love about this movie. Like uh, even even Ant Man that that I thought was uh, I thought it was an all right movie. All of a sudden, like that bit where he goes giant was amazing. That 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 big uh, twist, uh, and specifically, there's that moment when um, and I, I I'm convinced this is intentional. Uh, Spider Man says, "Hey guys, you see that really old movie, The Empire Strikes Back?" And then they're rolling their eyes, like, well, "Who? How old is this kid? Uh, millennials, am I right?" And uh, and then they and what he was really communicating was, "Let's tie up the legs, right?" I don't think that's all they wanted to communicate. This is the Empire Strikes Back of mm. the Captain uh, America franchise. You had the origin story as a standalone one-off movie. The Winter Soldier is A New Hope. That's the beginning. That's where you set up everything. This one, you begin with a set piece that stands on its own, that uh, uh, similar to the Hoth thing, you get a complicated, a slower second act. It's largely character driven. You end with a case where everybody's safe and all the fighting is stopped, but there's so much that's unresolved. And you, you say, you know, Captain uh, Captain America walks away. He's like, have your damn shield. And 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 Tony Stark is like, well, I don't know if this was the right thing to do. And uh, and then and then you walk away from it without everybody getting together with a big hug. This this is the Empire Strikes Back of the Captain America story, and they called it out in the movie. I I can see where you're going with that. I'm I'm not sure I'm a hundred percent convinced, but there's definitely parallels there. And and it is not a happy movie, uh, which Empire Strikes Back was not either. I think my it's hard to call it a criticism because on the one hand, I wanted it to end with a, a piece to hang on that says, oh, yeah, they, they'll be back in the Avengers together. Right. Uh, and they give you that when Cap says, but if you ever need me, call on the other end. As soon as he said that, I'm like, oh, you just kind of next generation to me. You like wrapped everything up real quick at the end so that you can have the, the next film make sense because it would have been pretty powerful to just leave it with like, yeah, they're not talking. They're not together. The Avengers are broken up. What's going to happen next? Uh, which would really complicate your future movies. But uh, I don't know. Like that felt more real than Cap saying, yeah, but, you know, if you ever need me, I, I'm sure I could get over my anger. I, I can't pretend like I know what the plan Disney has for this whole franchise is. You know, I don't know how long we'll get the Return of the Jedi of this trilogy post uh, post launch. But it does make sense that they would need to at least make it make sense for him to show up in one of the other movies. Well, without in it the being Avengers. Too weird. I, cause the way I, the reason the empire strikes back thing isn't working for me so much as I looked at this movie when I came out of it is like, Oh, that is the Avengers. That is definitely better than age of Ultron. And when I saw the Avengers, the first Avengers movie, there was a point where I'm like, the Hulk is fighting and Thor is fighting and black widow's fighting. And I had a smile on my face. Cause it was just like, you know, punch after punch after punch of these amazing people and these amazing characters and working together. And I had did not have that ever in Age of Ultron. And I definitely had it in Civil War when you had Spider-Man and they're fighting each other. Right. But you had Spider-Man and Black Panther and, and Ant-Man and Cap and Iron Man and Black Widow and Scarlet Witch. And the key is like all true to themselves and their characters going one after the other, after the other, after the other. And it was just, I, I caught myself with an unintentional smile on my face watching that. So to me, this is Avengers 2, not Age of Ultron. Yeah, no, I agree with that 100%. Uh, I, I will say that the original Avengers, I, Civil War suffers from, in some ways, the exact same thing that uh, Ultron suffered from, where uh, what, what I... The Avengers was great because when they were fighting each other, I understood exactly why they were fighting. And there was this awesome rubber band snapping back together moment of them all coming together as a team and taking down an insurmountable foe. I did not get that in Ultron and I did not get that in this movie. I got them fighting each other and it was really interesting, but I felt conflicted. I didn't know who to root for. That was a little bit challenging. And, and when it came time to snap together, Turns out it's one asshole. It's like, let's build up the whole, they're five super winter soldiers. Uh, anyway, they're dead. Turns out it's me. I'm just an asshole who wanted you guys to fight each other. <laughs> I did it. You know, it's like, um, 
uh, in that regard, that oh, was right, not the most. But you did most... have frozen people, which is another parallel to Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, okay, see, all right, you're just helping my case here. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm starting to see it. I think I consider the Avengers a new hope, and this is Empire Strikes Back, but I'm start, it's starting to sink in now. Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. Well, I'm glad we're on the same page here, but uh, I, 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 I'm not going to fault the movie for that. That's just you know something I wanted that I didn't quite get. Um, it was uh, it was delightful. I thought there was a lot of great dialogue. Loved the addition of the new characters. I think I think this kid is Spider Man. He's oh my, my Spider Man. Yeah. He's I've not felt this way since the first one with Tobey Maguire. Uh, and uh, you know I I don't know how well that one's aged because I haven't watched it in a long time. But but like as far as I'm concerned, let's start right now. Let's never talk about how he got his powers again. And this kid is Spider Man. He's in a Stark manufactured suit with eyes that squint and emote and all that stuff. The, what the Tobey Maguire film took an entire film to tell me they got uh, across in a 10 minute scene. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's incredible. All right. Uh, let's move on to happier times. Enough, enough civil war, enough, not uh, enough where the monster is actually ourselves fighting with each other. Let's go to game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, did I see, right? I believe at the 35 minute mark or so, there was like a comedy fart <laughs> in yes. Game of Thrones. Did you see that? Yeah. I did not notice it on first viewing, but I have since uh, seen references to it and the evidence, the video evidence therein. Yeah, no, I went back and watched it like four times and it got funnier to me each time. And I don't know that it's terribly out of character. That seems like the kind of thing Grand Maester Pycelle would do while he's while he's crap talking a, a, a walking Frankenstein no monster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. And then all of a sudden he walks in the room. Uh, it was it was great. I, I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I, I feel like this is my uh, my favorite season since season one, maybe at, at this point. Now, I'm not saying it'll continue that way, but uh, I I love uh, Jon Snow echoing Eddard Stark uh, and being the one to swing the axe and then setting aside his cloak. So, yeah, you know, basically I saying, not- like, no, no, I've got to pass sentence on these guys. That's right. But now my watch has ended because guess what? You don't end your watch till you're dead and I die. I was really surprised that he killed him. I was convinced he was going to get up there on stage, grandstand, talk about it. He's like, hey, man, you said till I died. And guess what? I died. Mercy for these guys. But uh, then I forgot, apparently, that I'm watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, uh, oh, no, let's murder them first and then say peace out. <laughs> you know? uh, no, it was great. Um, I am... I'm not going to say I'm enjoying uh, seeing uh, Daenerys in a rough spot, but I w- I am very much it's looking interesting, forward. Though, right? It holds your interest because it's not like, well, I know exactly what's going to happen next. Or last season where she's always fudging like, oh, what do I do? I'm so stuck here. Yeah, well, and, and I believe she's going to get out, but I'm interested to see how that goes. Uh, love. Do you want to know my theory on that? Uh, yes, go. Uh, Eileen and I cooked this up together, so I can't take full credit. Uh, we think... What's going to happen is because uh, they all are disrespect, like, yeah, mother of dragons, whatever. And Tyrion just released the dragons. The dragons are going to come. They're going to start terrorizing the Dothraki. And she's the only one who's going to be able to control them and save them. And then they're all going to be like, wait, you could you literally are mother of dragons. Oh, crap. Yeah. And then she will become the leader of all the Dothraki. Take them back to Marine. And I, I could totally see that. No, that yeah. totally makes sense. Uh, by the way, time out. We forgot to mention on the list of things that we watched. Uh, I walked in on you and Eileen watching oh. the first episode of Game of Thrones. That almost sounded bad. Uh, <laughs> watching the first episode of Game of Thrones. And that was a fascinating experience. Uh, number one, fully two thirds of the cast are living ghosts. As you watch them, they all look exactly 12 years old. And <laughs> there's stories. I'm like, why are you talking about this? This doesn't matter. This is going to end. Uh, nobody cares about this. Winter's coming. Come on, people. Yeah, when you know that the White Walkers are real and headed towards the wall, it it sets everything in perspective. But there were some interesting parallels there, too. Like, I I didn't really realize how fast some things happen uh, in that uh, and and how slow some other things happen. You know, Arya really isn't uh, 
you know, Arya Stark yet. She's just a little feisty troublemaker. On the other hand, Bran gets pushed out the window right away. Like that happens at the end of that episode, that very first episode. So uh, speaking it, of which, back to the current day, Bran's plot is finally super interesting. Oh, right. Maybe my favorite plot of all of them. Uh, uh, Max von Sydow can do no wrong. I love the 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 past exposition tourist uh, uh, extravaganza that we're seeing. And I'm with Bran. Every time Bran says, no, 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 I don't want to go. I'm like, yeah, don't go. I want to watch this. I want to like, watch no, young No, 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 we got to go see Leanne. She's in there and we heard her screaming and I want to, oh, crap. Yeah, yes, exactly. Uh, and uh, by the way. What the, a sword fight. I did not realize this because I'm not an aficionado, but I was reading, uh, I think it was the io9 recap from Rob Bricken, that that particular sword fight was not apparently full of flourishes and the kind of things where like, oh, I'm going to take on four men at once. So each of you take a turn like that. That apparently looked like a very much more realistic four on one. But I've got two swords and I'm a badass kind of fight. Yeah. Well, in that moment when you realize, first of all, how great was it that whoever they cast as as young Eddard Stark, the moment you saw him, you're like, oh, Ned. I mean, it was yeah. it was great. Right. Uh, I uh, Yeah. All of that I'm enjoying. And I enjoy the fact that they're teasing it and taking it from us. Uh, seeing um, uh, uh, Ramsey Bolton in his place. I loved watching his interaction with the car Starks where, where he called him out. He was like, you know, yeah, it's why you killed your dad. Cause your dad's a bastard. And he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. My dad died poisoned by her enemies. He's like, whatever ass. Um, and yeah, that guy isn't a car Stark, but now I'm blanking on what he actually is. Uh, but he's, he's, he's one of the North men of the North, right? right. And he doesn't take bullshit. And we knew, we knew that, from back when he was with Rob. So it's kind of cool to see that coming back as well. Yeah, by uh, by the way, Rick and Anosha in a bit of a uh, bit bit of trouble. All of a sudden Rick is interesting. Why can't I keep calling her Tonks because I can't remember Osha. Uh but but Thank but, but 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 Rickon is finally interesting. He's in the story again. Thank goodness. I mean, is he? Uh dude, I guarantee you, knowing uh, okay, first of all, if there's one thing this show's been good at doing is taking characters you have not cared about for the entire duration up until this point and suddenly making them most interesting in the entire series. So but, I, sh but the, the worst part of the episode for me, even though I know four people hanged at the beginning was Shaggy dog's head. Oh really? <laughs> oh, it was awful. <laughs> I'm like, what Shaggy dog just dead. Like, that's it. That's all. Like he doesn't even like go down in battle. We don't, ah, uh, dude. Uh, well, I, I, I tell you what, I'm totally into watching Rick and story. I hope there's some kind of fascinating prison break or something that happens. Although me saying that probably means he's definitely castrated and dead. I mean, they brought the actual same actor back when they absolutely didn't have to, right? Right. Like they could have gone with a, they, they've replaced Mursala a couple of times. They replaced some other actors a couple of times. Uh, the, I, uh, Tommen uh, got replaced. The Mountain, the mountain yeah. got replaced. Right. So they could have definitely got away with like, you know, we're not going to use the original Rick and you haven't seen him in seasons. They brought the same actor back and he looks way older. Right. So that's actually consistent with brand story somehow, I suppose. Uh, but good for that actor convincing them like, yeah, you want me. I'm Rick and yeah. Uh, well, and, and I and think that means that we don't see Rick and just get executed, that Ramsey is going to decide to keep him alive for whatever reason. Yep. Uh, let's talk about Arya's story. Uh, she has now gotten to a point. One element that I'm sure Arya, Arya. Oh, I'm sorry. A girl, a girl with no has name. no name. Brian. Okay, can we talk about a girl who has no name? Uh, a girl has no name. Uh, I've been through Pentos with a girl with no name. Okay. So they've already restored her sight. And I think it's fair game to talk about one twist that happened in the books that I didn't see here that I thought would be interesting. Uh, while she was blind in the books, she cheated. I'm using air quotes for the audio listeners. She cheated one of the tests by temporarily borrowing the eyes of, I think it was the cat in the room or, or some animal in the room. Basically she dipped into the same warg powers that Bran has exhibited. Uh, and, uh, as it, you know, as, as if it's a stark cheat and she surprised her teacher. Her teacher is like, uh, you know, like, how did you, okay. One question. How did you know that thing? And, uh, and she's like, uh, well, you ran out of questions. Sorry, bro. And she didn't tell. And it was cool to see that dynamic where she had a little power over her teacher in that, in that situation. And I don't know if they're saving that for another moment or if they're just not going to do it in the, in the TV show, but they don't I did seem to really be placing like as much emphasis on the, the warg power type thing, even with Bran. Yeah. 
Uh, although, I mean, Bran is fairly, you know, he's sufficiently mystical at this point. He's pure, straight up shaman, you know, communing with nature. But it's more like she, he talks with trees and sees flashbacks than he and like they spend a lot of time in the book about him inhabiting other animals. And they haven't spent much time with that. Yeah. Uh, did, did they do in the TV show him inhabiting Hodor at all? Sort of. They did the well scene and I don't remember how much of it they actually had him. But 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 he did. He, I, I'm pretty sure he did make Hodor do something. If you don't know the books, though, I, I feel like it could just come off as, oh, he's got mind control powers. He can make people do stuff. Yeah. Uh, people. Oh, and that moment where he screams father and he turns over his shoulder. That was a great that was yeah. chills inducing. I thought that was a really great moment. Uh, it's great also to see. Uh, to see Cersei and Jamie try to try to assert their power and fail at this point. And again, this is the biggest transformation in the series. Making them somehow sympathetic characters is astonishing to me. But for uh, God help me at this point, I mean, gods be good. This, uh, praise the seven. Uh, I, I want them to get a foothold in that in that horrifically, uh, you know, corrupt council. Speaking of, do you think the High Sparrow thwarted what they wanted Tommen to do. Dude, watching the High Sparrow talk, I pulled out a legal pad and I started taking notes. Feel this, the burn. This show, this show is a master's degree in, in social manipulation. You know, if I hosted a show about social engineering at the bar and on the streets, I would learn a lot of lessons from the way these people interact with each other. I like how he did the chimney trick with Tommen right there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I... I <laughs> I I was looking at that and I'm like, Tommen's going to do something because they 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 let into it like, all right, we've still got our next move and their next move got thwarted. I, I kept thinking, oh, well, he's going, he's just leading the High Sparrow on. It's like, no, the High Sparrow's the master at this. You're absolutely right. He's not leading him on at all. Uh, so I'm curious if Tommen turns against Cersei uh, next and what that might mean. Yeah, uh, I'm really curious. By the way, for the record, uh, if you enjoy the acting of uh, the High Sparrow, uh, that's that's actor Jonathan Price. I can't recommend highly enough that you go watch uh, Brazil. Uh, Brazil, directed by Terry Gilliam. It's this um, uh, apocalyptic uh, dystopian future where everything's run by bureaucracy. It's so good. So wonderful. And he's Just, great. Just uh, fill out the proper forms to acquire the movie. Uh, 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 so it was a 47B stroke, 47 B stroke, stroke D. 2. <laughs> yeah, I, I forget uh, what it is. <laughs> yeah, so I think the only scenes that we've missed, uh, haven't talked about yet, are Sam on the boat with Gilly, which is just a little bit of setup for what's eventually going to come. His intention is to drop her off with his family at Horn Hall and then move on to uh, the Citadel on his own. Dude, which seasick. I loved. That whole scene was so go I mean, they, they, they made it, quote unquote, interesting by having it be in the middle of a, a tumultuous sea storm. But I think that's that's intentional irony, because in this entire sea storm of the show that we're watching, this is the one calmest, purest, most relatable moment in the entire thing. Uh, two people talking about the future of their child and so on. Uh, it's it's so it was so delightful and brought me so much joy. And the best part of the whole thing, I don't know if it read this way to you, Buzz, but but after this moment where you start to feel the joy, it's like, oh, he cares about her, he cares about the kid, and he makes a funny face for the kid to make him laugh. But then you realize last second that he's not making a funny face for the kid, he's vomiting again. And it was yeah. like, that's so right. That was fantastic direction and writing. And then the only scene, I think, in this episode that really didn't do anything was the Tyrion trying to start a conversation. Loved that too. <laughs> and it was hilarious. It was <laughs> trying so to start up a drinking game. I mean, if anything, it illustrated the vague vibe that you had where it's like Tyrion does not belong here. None of his tricks work. All the things that made him such a charming courtier in, in the in the king's court don't work here because he's relating with a completely fundamentally different uh, class structure and different type of person. And oh, of I course, it's great to, uh, I am in love, but love, I, love. Tyrion's tricks never work. Like to me, that's consistent. And when he was the hand, briefly, we had that same thing of like, this doesn't work. Nobody respects him. This doesn't work. And yet he was able to make it work. So I think we're seeing kind of a replay of that where it's like he's frustrated, but he is smart. He's a thinker. He will think his way through it. Uh, and we also have Varys uh, well, with I his little birds being set up in Marine and a mirror of we finally know who the birds were in King's Landing now. Yeah, by the way, first of all, I don't know that I've ever liked Varys more than I do right now. 
It is the f- oh the Tyrion Varys buddy comedy is great. Well, sure, sure, but I always felt like Varys was a you know a, a, a snake on the edge of a leash. I don't know if that's a real metaphor, but 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 it's like I always felt like he would turn on me and make me regret supporting him or whatever. But at this point, I'm pretty sold. I think Varys truly does have the best interests of the realm at heart. I think that uh, in his own manipulative way, he's he's very good at listening and other people. I, I feel like, but I'd he is a snake on the edge of a leash, and he will turn against you <laughs> if it is in the. Interest of the realm to do so right but by the way but how it's gr- not personal how great was it to see how crude and amateurish uh his uh oh who's the uh the ejected not quite a maester over in yeah King's i can't Landing. remember the guy's name either. uh d- uh that guy like he's like oh you want candy i have candy tell me things and it's like oh come on man varies would have been so much more classier about this yeah absolutely all right speaking of classy let's move in kyburn Harlan- kyburn that was his Sorry. name hi how was it again kyburn Kyburn. Pass the Kyburn Pass. All right. Justified, episode four, season two, wherein a budding magician is shot in the hand and has his magic <laughs> career ended. Can I tell you, I think this might be my favorite episode of the show yet, full stop. Of Obviously, because it's got a magician in it. I mean, well, yes, there is that. But I felt for everyone, conflicted, uh, uh, conflicted Boyd Crowder is a fantastic character and the harder he tries to to walk the straight straight and narrow narrow the more i love him and and the more he questions himself the more interesting he becomes um the fact that he's living with uh ava you know or you know like that's an interesting dynamic that i know they're doing to keep her relevant to the story and it does color things knowing that you know she was making love with raylan for a while well um, and we started to see a little softening of their relationship here too right you know, as last week we we're like yeah there's nothing going on between them this week i wouldn't want to swear to it necessarily i'll tell you what though i love the fact that they are developing uh, Raylan's partner's uh, backstory and character. And I love the direction they did it. I felt so irrationally angry with the treatment he got at this halfway house and somebody, and granted the guy was doing it for quote unquote, all the right reasons. Like, Hey man, 12 steps. I fall down. I walk him up again or whatever. This is a soft punishment. I could send you back to jail, but, but just something about the smug. It was exactly well played where I was just like, please beat the shit out of him. Please beat the shit out of him. And then he did. I was like, yeah, wow. I'm like, sorry did, for you. No, it That's- was not okay that he beat the shit out of him. I, I it felt really good. I turned against him. I was with you up to that point. I was like, man, that is hard. Like, you don't let him go. It's his son. It's his son's birthday. Come on. You do something to make that happen. Just because he got his assignment wrong? I'm totally with you. Then when he beats the shit, I'm like, oh, this, 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 that's why this All person right, uh, is there. Well, time like, to, this person to clarify, cannot control himself. This is that hitting F5 for the quick save and then blowing off the head of whoever you're talking to in Fallout 4 and then be like, I know, I know, let me reload. Like, this was that moment, <laughs> except, except we get to see where it goes after this. Yeah, and you also, there's no quick save. Like, I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and I did not have any sympathy from him, for him from then on. I wanted him to get caught, and I was with his sister, who was like, yeah, no, I, I kind of want to shoot him. And I'm not really going to admit it to anybody because that's not okay, but he killed my sister, uh, and uh, maybe he didn't mean to, but he is a bad man. And we've been, we've been told, we've been shown that. And we were shown it again when he shot the magician in the hand. Yeah. Uh, Flex. His name's Flex. His name. Yeah. Which, by the way, in honor of Flex, I'm Flex. dedicating my next magic show to the memory of Flex's uh, left hand. <laughs> to Flex's left hand. Uh, that's awesome. The, it was nice to see an episode, like you say, that that gave the uh, one of the partners a little little backstory. Didn't focus entirely on Raylan. In fact, that one scene where they shoved in his ex-wife uh, talking to him about like what? Whoa, is it you? Oh, I, oh yeah, that that, that weird with... sympathy play back yeah. and forth. I'm like, man, save that for Westeros. I don't want to see that here. <laughs> it's like, uh, let's make it more interesting with a with a dwarf and, and dragons. Yeah, and, and uh, but but it it felt rushed. It felt like a scene that they felt like they needed to get in, and it didn't really hang with the rest of it. But yeah, they, yeah, they're I mean, starting to do a story arc, so they got to pepper this stuff. Maybe it'll maybe it'll pay off. But um, uh, what's her name? Character actor Margot uh, Martindale. Margot Martindale. Uh, yeah, that opening I thought was pretty good. Like that that whole laying cards oh, on the table. Yeah, you're right. And a bit of a chess that. game. Brings the apple pie. Like he is showing her all the respect he can. Because he has to tell her something he knows is going to piss her off and still pisses her off. But I think he did successfully mute the reaction, right? Yeah. No, I, uh, for all you people sitting there on your smug 
justified castles saying like, oh, they'll love it like I do someday. Your belief is um, verified. (laughs) Your belief has been shown to be borne out. That's right. That's why we call this show Born Out Again. (laughs) Born Out. All right, <laughs> let's wrap it up. Uh, by the way, if you guys want to chime in, we love to read your letters. We don't, we didn't have any triage this week, but you can write us at cordkillers at gmail.com and we'll be happy to, to read some of your thoughts right here on It's Spoiler in Time. And if you do, or even if you don't, we'll spoil you next time. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>